Russia's Jewish community has been watching the war in Ukraine with mounting alarm, but most have kept silent, fearing state reprisals if they spoke out against the Kremlin. And yet, as the fighting intensified, a senior figure in the community felt that silence was immoral. So he fled Moscow after 30 years as the city's chief rabbi in order to speak freely, and he joins me now from Berlin. He's Pinkas Goldschmidt, president of the Conference of European Rabbis, and he wants all Jews in Russia to get out now. His reasons? It is A, the rise in anti-Semitism, B, the possibility of a closing of the Iron Curtain, that it, it is going to be impossible to leave. Uh, number three are the harder hitting sanctions which are going to damage the economy long term. In Conflict Zone this week, we ask if Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky was right to criticize Israel's response to the war. Should Jews speak out whenever universal values are threatened? And will historians look back on this war as a wrong turning for Russia or the start of a new dark age. Rabbi Pinkas Goldschmidt, welcome to Conflict Zone. Tim, thank you for having me on your program. It's good to see you. Your initial response to the February invasion, if I can start with that, the February invasion of Ukraine, was basically to say nothing, not to support it, not to condemn it, in order, you said, not to get the Jewish community into trouble. Do you regret that initial response? You know, considering the shock uh, of uh, every single member of the community, and I think uh, many of the citizens in Russia, of the actual invasion, most people actually thought that uh, nothing is going to happen. I sat the day before with uh, many diplomats and members of uh, parliament and others, and they said, oh, who needs Ukraine? We don't need Ukraine. And so it, it was a shock, and uh, it took time till it registered that we are in here for an all-out war. You said later you realized keeping quiet in such circumstances is morally wrong, and yet that was the clear choice you made in the immediate aftermath of the invasion. I'm wondering why. Was it out of habit? It was... Uh, uh, we, we got... Um, I would say in the last years of um, the current regime, uh, we in the community basically um, we're like the whole of uh, Russian society, we're depoliticized, which means we did not comment uh, on political issues and we did not um, and, and we did not get involved in politics in order not, uh, not to get into trouble. Because if you support uh, one way or the, you do it the other way, if you don't support the regime, then you, then you, have, uh, you have problems. However, as um, the, um, uh, we understood the, that we're dealing here with uh, European war, uh, with uh, millions of refugees and uh, Jewish communities which are being destroyed after being so difficult to uh, rebuild after th the, the communist regime, after the breakup of the Soviet Union. Um, I came to the realization, uh, not everyone, I'm, uh, uh, I want to say this openly, that uh, not only can we stay silent, we have to do something about it. So in that case, have recent events in Russia and your response to them compelled you to rethink your attitude to morality? What is a moral response to an invasion of this kind? No, I don't think that. Uh, um, I think that um, since the changes which have happened in Russia have been, I would say, gradual. It has not been uh, from one day to the next. So uh, it was uh, difficult to pinpoint to the moment that uh, you had to say enough is enough. I can not stay silent anymore. And uh, however, the, the change, the, the, the major change in the country of uh, um, waking up the 24th of February in the morning and seeing with, um, with mass arrests and every last uh, 
uh, independent media being shut down, uh, we understood that uh, this was a major change and we live in a different country with different rules. You say you were living in a different country, but you lived in a country where President Putin had invaded and occupied Crimea in 2014. He'd fueled a war in the Donbass where some 15,000 people had died. So February 24th was a continuation of what had gone before, wasn't it? It was fully in line with the trajectory that his administration had been following, expanding Russia's borders, clamping down on civil liberties at home, and killing enough political opponents for the rest to get the idea. That, that much had to be clear, wasn't it? Yes, first of all, when, uh, with the Crimea, not one person died during uh, the takeover of the Crimea. And, uh, Do, you know, I, I can throw the okay? question back to you. Where was Europe? Where was, uh, where, where, where was the United States? And with, uh, why didn't they uh, push all these very punishing sanctions in, in 2014? Why did they wait till 2022? Good question. And we put the question to them. But I'm, but I'm, I'm asking you, were you not aware that rights and universal rights were being trampled and people were being repressed and killed in Russia during that period? It was, um, in, uh, I would say that number one, the, uh, the people who were repressed uh, was on a, in a smaller scale. Um, and uh, Tim, I want to tell you that um, um, the red line between a democracy and authoritarianism is not always clear. And when you pass from one system to the other, um, uh, it's not always clear when is the red line passed. So um, is it when there are no uh, more free elections or is it when some people critical of the regime are being jailed? It, it's, um, it, it's not always clear to, uh, that, uh, in other words, and you have quite a few countries where you pass from a demo democracy to an authoritarianism and then to totalitarianism. Are the lines clear? The lines are not always clear, only in hindsight. Is, is there a lesson that you took away from this that staying silent is not an option where universal rights are being trampled and people are being repressed? I think that um, um, in today's um, situation where, uh, where a country has been invaded and there are millions and millions of refugees leaving this country, it is very important for everyone to speak up. Everyone who can, not everyone can. Looking back, do you think if more people had spoken up and you talked about the Western reaction, you threw the question back to me as if I was talking for the West. I'm not actually talking for the West. But, but if more people had spoken out both in, in Russia and around the world, do you think that President Putin might not have gone ahead with the full scale invasion he launched in February? I... Uh, I uh, I'm, I, I tend to think that uh, if uh, uh, somebody who would have um, told on the 23rd of February uh, to the Kremlin that uh, the reaction in, of uh, the West, of uh, Europe, the United States, is going to be the one we have seen I highly doubt that uh, the Kremlin would have gone on, uh, on with this war. So is the Jewish community in Russia now rethinking the practice of staying silent and keeping their head down and trying to stay out of trouble? Should it? Uh, you know as well as I am, as I do, that uh, people who speak up are being fined, are being arrested. Uh, the businesses are being closed down, so uh, it is very easy to uh, criticize the Russian regime from the safety of, of London or Paris or Berlin. It is much harder to do it if you live inside Russia, your business is there, you have parents there, you have children there.
So it's uh, much easier to talk about it than actually to do it. But Rabbi Goldschmidt, making the right moral decision can't always be a cost-free exercise, can it? Take, um, yes, it, it is, every person has a free choice and every person has to take the right decision. So, um, I'm, uh, um, I'm concerned about the future of the Jewish community in Russia, and I'm not the only one concerned. Thousands and tens of thousands of Jews have left the country since the beginning of the invasion. And should those who stayed... And I think that by leaving, they have... I'm, I'm sure that by leaving, they, everyone who left the country made a statement. And, and, and should those who've left the country, what should, what should their attitude be now? Should they speak out? Should they say whatever they need to say? I think that everyone um, who has the possibility has to state and has to say what he thinks or what she thinks and um, speaking to hundreds and thousands of uh, members of my community and also of, uh, of uh, Russians, of other religions, I feel that, and I'm speaking with the people outside of Russia, I feel there is very little support for this war. A prominent politician, former minister, Nathan Sharansky, who was, uh, as you know, a dissident who was jailed in the Soviet Union, a refusenik, as they were called at the time, he says that if Jews have the chance to get out of Russia, they should take it, they should go. Do you support that view? Yes, I support this view and uh, for many reasons. And um, the many reasons why Jews today are concerned about the future in Russia, it is A, the rise in anti-Semitism, B, the possibility of a closing of the Iron Curtain, that it, it is going to be impossible to leave. Uh, number three are the harder hitting sanctions which are going to damage the economy long term. And number four, the possibility of that of the, there's going to be a general draft for the army and, and uh, number five is the widening repression of civil society. Let me, if I may, take you back to the time when you made the decision um, in March to leave Russia. You said that after two weeks soul searching, you left because you wanted to be able to speak out against the war and you'd been told the Jewish community would suffer if you did that and stayed. Can you clear up exactly what threats were aimed at you personally and by whom? I think that um, um, it was not only the possibility of, of speaking out. Uh, speaking out is important, but uh, as you know, Judaism, is a religion of deeds. It's not only a religion of thoughts or beliefs. It is the actual deed which is important for us. And we call this deed a mitzvah. And uh, speaking out is, has been secondary. First and most important has been uh, the feeling and the realization that we have to do something to help those thousands of refugees of our communities who had to leave to Eastern Europe just with uh, maybe with one suitcase who didn't have a roof on their heads. And that's what we did. We established under the aegis of the Conference of European Rabbis this fund, to, an international fund to help Ukrainian refugees. And I've been visiting, I left Russia to visit in in Eastern European capitals, in Budapest, and Warsaw, and also in Romania, all those thousands of Jewish refugees and other refugees who, who went there. And we have established programs for the integration and for the help of those refugees. So speaking out has been secondary. The number one uh, mitzvah, the one, number one um, deed which we had to do is to help. My question was about the threats that you personally received. How graphic, how clear were these threats? I think that if uh, you are a clergyman living in a certain country, uh, you can identify and you can understand when the, 
when uh, you're getting messages from certain quarters. And uh, it doesn't always have to be personal. It can be communal as well. So what was said to you and by whom? I don't want to go into more details. There are uh, still many members of the community living in Russia, continuing to work there with people in the clergy, we have rabbis, we have community leaders. I at this moment, I don't want to go into details. One or two Jewish leaders in Russia did speak out and did refuse to toe the official line. Couldn't you have done the same and, and, and stayed in Russia? Um, it's, um, I don't think that I would have been, A, I don't think I would have been able to help and to establish this uh, whole structure to help refugees staying in Russia. And I don't think I would have been able to communicate uh, to the world, to the Jewish world to the, uh, and to the world at large, the issues and the challenges we are facing. Did leaving Russia feel in any way like running away? I think that uh, if I've been the only one making this decision, maybe you're right. I'm, uh, I can tell you one thing, I, I have a very good friend. She's, uh, um, uh, she's one of the leading uh, uh, journalists uh, in the opposition. And uh, initially she was quite upset that I left, but uh, a month later she left herself. So you felt vindicated? It's not a question of feeling vindicated. It is a question of, uh, of um, today we have tens of thousands of members of my community who are living outside Russia. I would say if we're talking about people who used to come to our synagogues, I would say even the majority is outside of Russia. My community is all over the world. They're in, they're in Dubai, they're in Israel, they're in London, and in, in Germany, and uh, the immigration to Israel from Russia was uh, twice as high than from Ukraine in the last, uh, since, the, since the war started. And uh, I'm responsible for the wider community. And I, I always also believe that I'll be able to help our community, which stayed on in Russia better from the outside than from the inside. Rabbi Goldschmidt, it seems that relations between senior Jewish figures in Russia and Ukraine have been badly damaged by the events in recent months. Um, in March, Ukraine's chief rabbi, Moshe Azman, roundly condemned leaders of the Russian Jewish community and said your failure to denounce the invasion was tantamount to complicity. How hard is it going to be to repair those ties? I don't know. There were some leaders who supported the invasion. I don't want to um, express myself. I don't want to judge them. Who am I to judge? I can tell you that my relationship with our Ukrainian colleagues is wonderful. And uh, did you call Rabbi Azman? He says, when he said, I'm talking to you, dear Russians, dear Jews, remember that one who is indifferent, is an accomplice to war crimes, crimes against humanity. I stand with the Holy Torah and I tell you to wake up. Hardly anyone, he said, has called me. Do you understand the sense of abandonment that he had from the Jewish community? Uh, I for sure, I for sure uh, can feel it. In, Ukraine doesn't have only one chief rabbi, by the way, you know. Uh, we have a quite, a, we have, I think, three chief rabbis in Ukraine, and we are in touch with them. And I myself, uh, just three weeks ago, spent a whole long weekend in the town of Neptune in Romania with 1,200 refugees from Odessa with the chief rabbi of Odessa. So uh, we are in touch with our uh, colleagues from Ukraine, and uh, I also spoke a few days ago to a group of new immigrants from Russia and Ukraine in Jerusalem. And you had over there in the room, you had about 40, 50 young people, and they came f from Moscow, from other cities in Russia, and from Odessa, and from Kiev, and from Nikolai, even, even from Mariupol. And you should see those people just sitting together, trying to help each other in the new country. They all left the countries of origins, not because they wanted to, but because 
of the impossibility to stay. Talking of helping Ukrainians, President Zelensky, himself a Jew, has had harsh words for what he sees as Israel's inadequate response to the conflict. Uh, to Israel's mediation efforts, he said there can be no mediation between good and evil. He has a point, doesn't he? I want to tell you, those people who want to criticize Israel for not going, uh, uh, not uh, joining Europe with sanctions against, um, against Russia, I want to remind them that Israel is not buying oil and gas from Russia. Israel is not financing the war. It is Europe buying gas and oil from Russia is financing the war in Russia. Some of that criticism, Rabbi Goldschmidt, has come from inside Israel itself. The former Prime Minister Ehud Olmert, for instance, he didn't think much of the government's reaction in February. There are times, he said, when you have to decide who you are, what you stand for. You can't fool around, you can't fool yourself. If Israel were, like America, trying to rally its allies, would we like our best friend saying, well, there are pros and cons and we've got other things to think about? He's not saying do the easy thing. He's saying, do the right thing. You have no sympathy with him, with his views? Okay. The same way that Europe uh, is, is trying to do the right thing, but uh, obviously it is impossible to leave elderly people or children in unheated homes in middle of December and January, the same way Israel cannot leave millions of people prone to attacks from rockets from Hezbollah and from the Iranian-sponsored guerrillas in Lebanon and Syria. So each country wants to join, uh, wants to join the sanction regime or to criticize. However, each country has their priorities to, to protect their citizens first. But Rabbi Goldschmidt, Ukrainians are, are fighting for their lives and the survival of their unitary state. And Israel is saying, yeah, well, it's terrible, but we've got more important security concerns to worry about with Iran and Syria. You said in July, nowadays the world is looking at Israel and the Jewish people and expects us to be on the moral high ground. And I'm just wondering whether this position is the moral high ground you want to occupy. Within Israel itself, you have uh, a discussion among, it might become an issue in the upcoming elections in November among political leaders, to what extent Israel should be involved, should not be involved in this conflict. So Israel, um, um, I would say, um, is uh, right now, has taken a position, uh, Yair Lapid, the current Prime Minister of Israel has taken a position criticizing Russia. And I want to tell you, Tim, that uh, Israel ha has had problems because of it. Russia decided to close the Jewish agency. This didn't happen from one day to the next. There was a reason for it. Do you regard the changes in Russia as irreversible, Rabbi Goldschmidt? Will historians look back on this, in your view, as a wrong turn for Russia or the beginning of a new dark age in the country? Right now, I think that uh, Russia is entering a, a period of uh, deep isolation, um, a new, almost uh, totally closed iron curtain with Europe, not with Asia, but with Europe. and. Um, I think that um, the, the, the coming uh, period is going to be very difficult. Do you foresee ever going back? Do you want to go back? As uh, you know, we have to be optimists and I hope that one day I'll be able to get back. Rabbi Pinkas Goldschmidt, it's been good to have you on Conflict Zone. Thank you very much indeed for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Tim, for inviting me. <laughs>